Hello, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this timely and important webinar on the land reform agenda in Kenya, which is co-organized by Kenya Land Alliance, the Government of Kenya, the Land Portal Foundation, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and the European Union. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Michael Odiambo, and I'm the Director of People, Land and Rural Development. And it's my distinct honor to moderate this forum. Our discussion today is on land reform in Kenya. Land use and land reforms are at the heart of Kenya's political and economic future stability. The quest for policy and institutional reform is driven by concerns about equitable access to land, efficient and accountable land administration, and security of tenure, particularly of community land. When the National Land Policy and the Constitution of Kenya 2010 were adopted, this constituted a singular achievement for land reform. But eight years down the line, the challenges of gender disparity in security of community land tenure and poor land administration persist. This webinar will review the land reform process and address these and other challenges with a view to defining a path forward that will lead to equity and justice in land reform and the use that benefits communities and increases food security. The panelists will address five key questions. First, where are we in the land reform process in Kenya? Secondly, what are the main challenges that need to be addressed in policy frameworks on land reform and use? Three, how can the gender imperatives of land reform be actualized? Four, what are the implications of community land dispensation? Finally, how is digitization addressing underlying inconsistencies in land registers? I have the pleasure to introduce to you our esteemed panelists of today. The three panelists are Dr. Colin Sodotio Law, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Nairobi Law School. Ooh. Mr. Odenda Lumumba, who is the chief executive officer at Kenya Land Alliance. And Ms. Husna Mbarak, who is the land governance program manager of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations in Kenya. These panelists bring to this discussion many years of engagement with land reforms in Kenya. And we look forward to a dynamic discussion that will provide insights into the way forward for the reform process. We will begin with a round of questions with the panelists. This will be followed by some discussion among panelists. We encourage participants to please ask questions. Use the questions feature to post questions to the panelists, and we will ensure that these are addressed in turn during the open discussion that will follow after the interventions by the panelists. Let me post the first question to Odenda Lumumba. Mr. Lumumba, where are we in the land reform process in Kenya? Uh, essentially, Kenya has gone through the constitutional, legal, policy, uh, institutional framework. But when it came to implementation, where we ought to be, the process has become so sluggish uh, to the extent that uh, if I measure Kenyan land reforms from the indicators of restructuring property ownership, production structure, support services uh, and land, land delivery systems, I would basically say that Kenya has gone off the mark. And my reasons of saying so are that uh, given the, our, our constitution, new constitutional dispensation, we were supposed to have redressed historical land injustices. We ought to have reviewed land leases we ought to have fixed the minimum and maximum acreage uh, to a land private holder. We ought to have operationalized land, uh, the operationalized community land recognition, protection, and, and registration. But all these stand at crossroads. And there's what we are now witnessing is a situation which can be basically be said 
instead of going the road of land reforms, we are now doing counter reforms in as far as the whole mechanism of rolling out uh, land reforms are concerned in Kenya. And that is the main uh, concern that we have at the moment. Okay. Husna, do you agree with Mr. Lumumba? And do you have anything to add? Yes, actually, I will kind of agree. But uh, one thing I need to, to put forth is that within the policy agenda around land reform, I think Kenya Kenya is quite far advanced. Uh, the only problem or the only challenges which we really need to look into is the, the implementation, the operationalization of those um, policy and I mean and the laws in place and the enforcement of it. Because when you talk of land reform, it's not it's actually it doesn't amount to policy reform only. So it's the whole cycle. We have beautiful laws, but we have to make sure they are implemented. We have to make sure uh, that they are enforced by all uh, by all by all means. And I think this this brings up around all stakeholders involved, including I mean the government to actually execute and 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 enforce, but also the people to be able to account and actually use the laws. Uh, I mean, um, parallel to the to the enforcement and the execution, and I think this is this is where now Kenya should really uh, fall. I mean, really prioritize in, in so many ways. Okay, so we have beautiful policies and laws. Institutions have been created, but yes. we are not making progress in realizing the vision of the land reform process. Doctor Dute, why is this the case? Why are the under what are the underlying reasons? behind the lack of progress in the reforms? I think there are several underlying reasons, Michael, and I want to just mention three. The first one is, I think, you know, why do we have been a reform trajectory? We have unwilling reformers. You know, land is a political issue, and unfortunately, the political elite uh, see land reform as going against their political interests. I think that's the first underlying issue. The second underlying issue, why land reform hasn't gone on as well as it should be, is we require all hands on deck in the land reform trajectory. And two critical stakeholders have removed their hands on that deck. The first group of stakeholders that have removed their land, their hands on the deck are development partners. Uh, in the run up to the adoption of the national land policy, development partners were very focused on land issues, but because of negative reactions from government, you find that funding to land reform work has dwindled a, a little bit. I dare say you'll only find one or two organizations supporting that. Sadly, even civil society that were extremely critical on land issues aren't as engaged as possible. So you find people doing a little work by doing it differently. Just this morning, we we're having a separate conversation with Husna, and you will notice that there's an effort to review the national land policy. And sadly, the land commission that is supposed to be in charge of that process is going about this thing without involving stakeholders. So you cannot be able to make pro progress when you think that the process of reforming is not a process that is inclusive, it's not a process that is consultative, and it's a process that uh, focuses on delivering the good, the good for all candidates. In, in a sense, you are anticipating, you have anticipated my next question. Uh, building on what you've just said, uh, maybe you can uh, go further and just identify what the major challenges are that we would need to address in order for us to move in the, in the policy reform process, in the land reform process. I think Dr. for Dr. us Dr. to move with you. For us to move in the land reform process, there are several things we'll have to do, Michael. The first thing that we will have to do is we all have to re-engage as institutions. And this is government must realize they can't solve the land problems on their own. So they must be willing to engage. Uh, actors must realize that government on its own or criticizing government alone will not deliver land reforms. So we must be proactive. Thirdly, I think uh, we must realize this land is for communities and is for people on the rural areas. So we must bring them on board. We must create awareness for them. And I think lastly, uh, we need to realize that resource allocations are critical. Land reform is a fairly expensive process, so we need to ensure that there's sufficient resources, both from government and also from development partners, for the process to be able to move forward. That's and then, sorry, how can I forget that? 
uh, I, th I think knowledge generation and knowledge dissemination as part of that process is going to be critical. And as part of the work, that as, an, as, the, as the academy, we can be able to contribute by providing options to be able to ensure that our land reform process moves in a manner that is acceptable and in a manner that aligns itself to, for example, the AU guidelines and policy frameworks that were adopted mm -hmm. in 2010. And nine. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. That is that is helpful, and it's also helpful that you also identify what the academy where you come from can contribute to this. Odenda, do you have anything to add to what we need to do in order to be able to address the challenges, and I maybe think, maybe uh, speak to what civil society can do? I, I think the, uh, the uh, quickly is, is practically we need to face the challenge of disjointed organizations and institutions charged with land and natural resource sector governance. Uh, basically, the National Land Commission is supposed to be coordinating, monitoring, and oversighting all agencies that are managing land and natural resources for public good, interest, and purpose. That is not uh, happening. For the civil society, I think uh, we need to, the challenge we have been facing is basically we are basically donor dependent. And as it has been said, the donors have uh, slackened or they have other priorities other than land reform. And therefore, we really need to face the challenge of how do we get the taxpayers' money to uh, in Kenya uh, to finance the civil society operations so that it is not only calling on civil society to be accountable for what they do, but also to be accountable to the extent that the taxpayers' money would be uh, used for them to cause participation uh, in the land reform process. Those are the key elements I would add. Thank you. Husna, you, by default, you now talk for the development partners here. And as, uh, as, as, uh, as Collins has indicated, development mm. partners who are key to the process when it started and then they slackened. What, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, what are the challenges from the perspective of development partners? I think the, 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 the main challenge has for any development partner to engage, it ha there, has to, there has to be stability. It doesn't, I mean, I, I could call it political stability, I could call it social stability, I could call it even economic stability. Let's, let's look at what has happened in Kenya for the last, uh, actually, eight years, especially when we had uh, the new institutions coming up, like the national land policy. There was quite a lot of uh, confusion around uh, whose mandate is where, whose mandate is, I mean, who's supposed to do what, especially at the government uh, at the government level. And I think that's one of the main challenge which uh, there was no clarity and uh, the development partners could not really engage. I must say the current uh, development partner group on land for Kenya is being chaired by, by FAO after USAID handed over. And we are trying actually to, to re-engage so, so as we are able to really know what, where where can we put in, and we are using what currently FAO is working around land governance in Kenya with the, with the EU funding. But just to add, uh, I think I think uh, with within both the development partner, the government, the the the, the, the supply side of the, the the institutions, there is lack of uh, coordination. If you look at what government is doing, as I stated earlier, the NLC is doing their thing, the ministry is doing their thing, the various other agencies and institutions, parastatals, are doing their, their, their thing. Some of their processes are quite contradicting each other. There, there is, actually, there is no coordination. And I think that is where one of the main challenges in this in this country is coordination. We might really want to look at how can we co I mean how does the how can the government want to coordinate their their processes and also even from the angle of development partner how do they really need to re-engage and also coordinate the work within within Kenya. There's a lot of duplication of efforts but that doesn't mean that is bad. It could be very good but I think coordination will be the main the main uh, prioritized area for, mm. for engagement within the land reform agenda. Thank you. I think that that gives us a good basis to continue our conversation. We have a fairly good picture of where we are, what is holding us back, and what needs to be done to move forward. Now let's turn to substantive issues for land reform. And I'd like to ask Husna to start us off on this with regards mm -hmm. to gender. Husna, how can the gender imperatives of land reform be actualized? Um, 
actually when we we were discussing some sometimes that uh, when we look into gender we only look at like look at women but i must i must i must state that uh, probably for a for a long time and uh, the move for affirmative action in kenya are around really engaging uh, targeting uh, both men and women but having affirmative action to target uh, women into the whole uh, reform agenda is quite crucial looking at uh, the various aspects of uh, the use the participation within uh, the planning and uh, actually bringing everybody on board to be to be able to 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 make sure they they make good and conclusive decisions in a participatory way is very important and that that brings in the whole aspects of uh, we are all equal before the law and uh, of course the sovereign power of uh, of kenya lies with the people that is the both may the, the the women and the and, and and the men and i think it's also high time of course when we look at affirmative action they have to be controlled so currently for for for, for kenya when you're looking at the whole participation of women in the land reform agenda, but also in terms of management of the land and natural resources, is quite wanting. So we might we 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 need really need to bring on board looking at the value they bring around agriculture, around uh, you know the the whole aspect of the management of it. And I'm sure uh, nobody will. I mean, looking at the customary ways, nobody will really look into exploiting of uh, the natural resources in a way that I'll just use selfishly in a way that I'll just use it for me today and don't have it tomorrow but if you look at the whole intent of even the rural women the rural men all about sustainable management of of of, of land and natural resources and I think that should really be documented and should really be accepted uh, in a way that uh, I mean recognized in a way that is also within policy frameworks within the implementation and the execution of all the land reform agenda the both male and and and, uh, and uh, women are, are are tagged in okay odenda what are your thoughts on how to ensure that gender imperatives are actualized yeah i will basically start by saying uh, this october and october for me means looking back 10 years ago we recognize the role of the rural women uh, not just uh, rural women, but their labor force in agricultural production. Uh, October uh, talks about the poverty day, and the face of that poverty has been the woman. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, food security or the World Food Day in October. Uh, essentially, I would say that uh, beyond uh, simple uh, uh, thinking and intents, we just need to implement the constitutional provisions that promote gender equity and equality. And we do have those uh, very clearly uh, in the Kenyan constitution. Uh, I would basically also say that uh, the imperative of, of the gender actualization should be basically be faced from the political economy of agrarian change by basically answering the basic questions. Who owns what in Kenya? And who does what uh, in that in this particular space? And who gets what in this space? And what do they do with it? These four basic questions uh, will basically shame all of us in terms of the role of women and how we have uh, belittled the change in, in the gender imperative to titling, where the titling process is going on, but essentially it is affirming the men the male dominance or the main dominance in, in matters land. That is what needs to be fixed. And if we can just answer those four basic questions, I think we are home and dry. Do you have anything to add to what Usna and Odenda have said with regards to gender? I think just uh, a slight uh, difference from the moon. I think uh, in the one area where we've made substantial progress is in the area of gender, at least on paper, because before the 2010 constitution, a lot of land relations were based on the fact that women's greatest concern was in terms of being a labor force for agricultural production. And then the constitution recognizes two fundamental things. The constitution recognizes that one, uh, in the past, women have been discriminated against in terms of ownership of land, they have been discriminated because they were actually required to get approval from their husbands before they could get mortgages. But also, secondly, that uh, husbands 
would sell matrimonial property without consulting women. And the constitution now requires A, that the matrimonial home must be the joint names of both entities. The second is that when you are buy, mortgaging, when you're getting, um, when you're selling land, you have to get approval from your wife. That's, so for me, that's useful. The second thing that's useful is the constitution recognizes that our practices as a country, are, in terms of traditional pra cultural practices, have been discriminative against uh, women. And Article 60 of the constitution makes provision for the elimination of those cultural practices. I think the challenge, and that's why I agree with Odenda, the challenge is that the process of actualizing these provisions, because of what we said in terms of the stalling of land reforms, have not been implemented. So when you go to rural areas, you'll find that uh, women are still treated as second citizens. They are still not seen as if they own land. But then the other issue is as we worry about dealing with land, we also must worry about the opportunities that we, women have, the opportunities to education, the opportunities to employment and the opportunities to capital so that they are able to also hold, uh, use and transfer their property rights to land. Thank you. Uh, the second area of, uh, of reform, one of the major areas of reform was the on community land. And let's turn to that now. And Dr. Dote, can you start us off on what you see as the implications of land reforms in regards to community land rights? I think I just made the point that we have made the greatest tries in gender. The reverse is true in community land. We have made the least amount of strides in community land. And we've made the least amount of strides because for a long time, our official policy, legislative and administrative practices saw community land as what Garrett Hardin used to call the tragedy of the common. It needed to be converted into other forms of property. And this was despite the clear position by African scholars like Professor Ogendo, who argued against looking at Africa as community land as African community. When we adopted the 2010 constitution, we recognized the importance of community land. Unfortunately, the process of implementing that provision has been slower than other positions. People will remember in 2012, when we were enacting new land, community land was not amongst them. It's only in 2016 that we then enacted the new land. And even when we did, the regulations to operationalize it have not been put in place. Parliament uh, just rejected those regulations a few months ago. So we still have a law, which law has not been operationalized. This is dangerous, Michael, because if you look at uh, areas like Turkana, we have discovered extractives. We've discovered extractives, so community land is being sometimes uh, appropriated without necessary compensation. And there are people who have argued, by the time we implement the legislation, there luckily will be no community land to talk about. So for me, that is, I think is the greatest challenge in terms of the process of implementing community land. And it's critical that land reform focuses on community land because close to 80% of our land is owned communally. So if we don't deal with community land, then land reforms will be land reforms which are land reforms in the air and not addressing the fundamental concerns of the majority of our population in the country. Absolutely. Uh, Husna, this is also an area of major concern within your program. You are, what do you yeah. have to add to what Dr. Rote has said? Actually, I must, I'm, I'm, I must uh, confirm that um, as much as we are working around uh, community land, we, we're really trying to, to, to have the aspects or the principles of the VGT, VGTs and the, and the guidelines, uh, uh, in, uh, the AU guidelines and stuff like that. But the problem has been into really the implementation of, uh, the recognition is very good in law around com uh, community, community land rights, but now the, the, the implementation of the same law is what, uh, you know, is, we are waiting for. And in this, uh, the country is uh, being uh, ruled by, I mean, it, it's under rule of law. And for this, meaning that it has it has to be actualized through a regulation, which to date actually has not been um, been, <laughs> been enacted or have not been approved by, 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 by the National uh, Assembly. And that definitely brings in a, a stop 
to the whole thinking or the whole practical aspects of actualizing actualizing that law till the regulations are, are passed through, meaning that for anything to be legal around securing of uh, community lands, it has to be through after after the the regulations have been have been approved. But all, in all, the, the the main intent is around um, having it for the people and by the people. And I think this is one of the, the, the best way that people are able to manage their resources. The communities are able to manage their uh, resources in the best sustainable way way possible and i think for me is uh, is is uh, is one of the of the best um, uh, action or best practices that the country is uh, is i mean intending to 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 have and i think this also brings in the factor i mean the the, the recognition on the uh, around um, cultures the recognitions around the community of uh, of common interest and also bringing the power to, to 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 the people especially around land use it also brings in the you know the change or the enhancement development positively around their livelihoods and that the security of Kenya becomes you know everything in this in this country so you can you can be able to negotiate you can be able to to decide on how you you want uh, to really uh, use your land in a way that is good for you and good for, for the future too. So our 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 focus currently in Kenya is really on the how to be able to secure community land interests in this country, and that is what we we are we are, we are trying to showcase the best way possible using the the the, the national and also the international uh, laws and uh, practices which have worked well for for communities. And I think uh, even the the definition of communities within the the Kenyan Constitution and the, and the and the Community Land Act actually brings out that recognition that community comes first before public and, and private. And I think this is, this is very, very important to be able to be actualized in, in Kenya. Odenda, your thoughts? I think for me, uh, this is the point at which, if it was fashionable, I would have said communities need to uh, start a revolution. And the revolution for me would be the recognition, protection, and registration is being circumvented by not only Kenya, but all East African countries. Uh, and this has come in the form of uh, putting forward new legislations about the compensation laws, uh, which is basically trying to disabuse the new dispensation of community land regime, uh, because all the East African countries, Kenya inclusive, they are hell-bent on a mega projects approach as the way out of uh, our, our poverty or to spur economic uh, development. But in that, they seem to forget that uh, communities and the space which they occupy is the space that is available for infrastructure, is the space that is that has and is embodied with the extractives. It is the space that it is uh, available for green economy, blue economy, if you may. And I, I basically uh, say that uh, short of a revolution, given that we are talking about uh, 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 going for a referendum again on the constitutional provisions, and given that we are eight years since the promulgation of the constitution, and, and almost 10 years since we adopted the, the national land policy, I don't have any hope other than saying, let the communities of Kenya and East Africa rise up and be counted. Yeah, okay, but our, our, we we'll, we'll need to come back to this a little later because uh, we we thought when the land policy was adopted that it was quite revolutionary. But let's come to that after we have had our final conversation around digitization. Uh, we need to look at digitization is one of the key uh, aspects of the reform process and Husna. How is digitization addressing the underlying inconsistencies in land registry? How is it contributing to this reform process in a positive way? Uh, for me, uh, like we say, the world is going digital in so many ways. But uh, with the aspects of uh, documentation and uh, the land administ administration, I think is uh, is is uh, in Kenya. Um, 
is, is what the, the government is, uh, is moving forward with in a way that uh, they want to document and also this means access by the users is going to be easy. But also this will uh, in so many ways cut down on time, cut down on energy and energy will look into human resources and stuff to be able to to have work done efficiently or inquire, uh, inquiries done efficiently, aspects of uh, conflicts could be uh, pegged out, but 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 also uh, it also con confirms security to so much of uh, the information, but also is centralized where you can you can um, you can be able to access information at whatever point you you will be, especially if if everything is going to 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 be online. This at, at some at some point also reduces corruption because it's within uh, within the system we know what happens to aspects of uh, land uh, documentations in country we have uh, issues to do with uh, files go missing we have issues uh, to do documentations are destroyed uh, which are in, in, in hard copy so it's important that these things are done online and it's one of the most secure looking at the practices around other countries in the in the world and for Kenya I think uh, the, 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 the government is really trying to have this done well. I know they are also currently with the with the with our with the EU funded program uh, which is FAO is implementing. They are currently looking the into a custom yes the digitization process. They're looking into a customer portal uh, linked to the e-citizen where you can you know do a lot of a transaction. But also if you look at look at this uh, digital system also it uh, kind of uh, monitors and and uh, especially where uh, monies are involved financial and economic uh, aspects are involved because every every other transaction will be transparent and it is easy actually to account on the on the on the processes but also be able to account on the on the monies so for 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 me i mean um, I, I feel that uh, this is one of the the Actually, it's, I would say it's long overdue because it, it's taken a while for, for, the, for, for the country to be able to decide what software to use, what, uh, what type of a, a LIMS, a land information management system, the country will require, how is it integrated, you know, all the land registries and how is it integrated to the financial institutions, to the uh, credit uh, facility, to other agencies of the government. Uh, it's taken a while, but I think they are moving forward in a in a very positive uh, step to be able to actualize the 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 whole process. Okay, Odenda, what are your thoughts? Um, Kenya is the home of uh, mobile money, and for me, that's the the best way Kenya understand digitalization. Uh, they can now reach their money and transfer it very quickly. And uh, the optimism that uh, Husna has is a very normative position. Actually, everybody would want to have uh, land uh, systems digitalized so that we can see our plots on our phones as we wake up, as we go all over. Since we have an attachment to land that is more than ever in the world, uh, witness in Kenya. However, I think that uh, uh, the experience uh, we, are, we have had in Kenya with the National Land Information Management System that was duly uh, sponsored by uh, the Swedish International Development Agency, uh, but is barely just gathering dust uh, within the National Land Commission. For me, it's a pointer of a very reluctant digitali digitalizing country, and that we are very busy trying to computerize very few uh, records uh, without even uh, doing due care to do the ground truth thing to find out what is it that we are putting in uh, in, in the digital system. Is it clean, cleaned up information or are we digitizing disputes? Uh, the other element I would basically say that as we move towards uh, digitalization of land records, I think it is important that as a country we embrace freedom of of information or access to information 
appalling because it becomes foolhardy when we start digitalizing and the only focus we seem to have is how to uh, use digitalization to collect the tax. I think tax is important, but it's not the all, all of it. It's not the, the, whole, the whole thing. So we must be very careful not to be basically uh, embrace digitalization simply because it helps us to collect dues uh, on land, but rather it, it must facilitate the whole process of enjoying the transactions, the usage, and all the uh, imperative information that people need to utilize their land. And that, thus, I would say that we are too slow because we ought to be doing this to all land, and especially if we had done so by embracing the community land tenure regime, it really requires to be on, uh, on the platform because community land is the borderline of Kenya. If you asked me between Kenya and Uganda, where, where is the borderline is community land? Is it digitally known? No. Between Kenya and Ethiopia, where is, where is the borderline? It's community land. Is it on the, on the platform? No. Between Tanzania and Kenya, where is the, the, the borderline? Community land. Is it on, on the platform? No. And I could tell you that even community land vis-a-vis -vis the ocean, Indian Ocean, it is not on, 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 the, on the platform. That starts worrying me. And basically, I would say we need to do more. And we need openness mm -hmm. other than opaqueness while doing this. Dr. Dote, openness is, uh, I guess, the essence of digitization. We should not have opaqueness with digitization, should we? Your thoughts on this digitization process? We shouldn't have uh, opaqueness in digitization. But you see, uh, Michael, our efforts at digitization only solves one problem in the land reform trajectory. It solves the process of transparency and the process of efficiency. But that is, in my view, a transactional view of land reforms. Because it ensures that you're able to transfer your land more effectively. It's similar to the focus the government has had over the last three years on titling. Just two days ago, I listened to the deputy president saying, you know, the solution to poverty uh, in this country is the process of issuing title deeds. Because now people can be able to go and get loans. They can be able to trade their land. Uh, well and good. But you know, the fundamental issue that requires to be solved is actually not just uh, digitization. The fundamental issue that requires to be solved is entitlement as opposed to titling. We need to clarify who owns what land. We need to be sure those boundaries are clear so that when we are registering, as Lumumba says, we don't end up registering disputes. And I think we have focused a lot on digitization and forgotten to address the fundamentals, which is about entitlement, which is about uh, clarifying the rights. Having said so, I'm a complete supporter of digitization because it solves one end of the spectrum. All we need to do is to ensure that is not all we do as a country, that all our process of land reforms becomes a process which is only on the process and not on the substance, because digitization focuses on the process. It doesn't focus on the substance. We must ensure both substance and process are addressed if we must have sustainable and long-lasting land reforms. To remind everyone that titles, title deeds don't create rights, they affirm existing rights. So unless the procedure of creating those rights is proper, having a title deed does not necessarily ensure security of, of that property right. Exactly. We have come to the end of the yeah, we come to the end of the five questions that we'd set for ourselves. And uh, I'd like to just maybe go back to just a bit on uh, to, to delve deeper into what we've discussed. One thing that is clear is that uh, the policy reform process has created good policies. Equally clear is the fact that those policies are not being implemented. There is a challenge for implementation, both in terms of putting in the necessary legal and regulatory framework for implementation, but also just in terms of substantively implementing the policy. So the question that maybe we could round off this conversation with is what what can we do? What needs to be done in order to ensure implementation? I think we've been, been very good as a country in, uh, in, the, in the promulgation of policies, but our weakness is in having these policies adopted. So we have policy making, it's almost an industry. Every pol policies are being produced every day. 
but we don't seem to reflect on what progress are we making in terms of implementation. Can I have your thoughts on how do we move to the same level of efficiency in implementation as we have in promulgation and adoption of policies? And maybe we'll start with you, Dr. Dote, as, a, as an academic. I think this conversation that we are having today is because laws and policies don't implement themselves. I think as part of implementation, there are several things we need to do. One of the things we need to do is to create awareness on the existence of those laws and policies. Because once people are aware, they will claim their rights. The second thing that we need to do is to ensure that institutions that are responsible for implementing the laws are manned by the right people. I want to use this opportunity, for example, say the absence of government in today's discussions is disturbing because with them, we'd be able to share ideas, they'd be able to carry out some of those ideas. Hopefully next year, the term, when the term of the National Land Commission come, uh, comes to an end, we'll have men and women who have the moral turpitude and who have the conviction to be able to push the land reform agenda forward. Lastly, I think we need to ensure that government allocates sufficient resources to be able to ensure that the land reform agenda is carried forward. Mm. Then the civil society, in a sense, midwifed this reform process. I mean, and Kenya Land Alliance, you specifically played an important role in pushing for the policy to be put in place. But now we, the, the second struggle is how to get that policy implemented. How do we do that and what role does, what does the civil society have to do and how does it have to do differently in order to make sure that that happens? I think uh, the civil society did the advocacy very well. Uh, but I think we need to switch gear to the implementation gear. And to do that, I think we, we do not want to advocate for good policies, laws, and legislations or institutional frameworks and let uh, implementers be those who are part of the problem we are fixing. Right now, the reason why we have not moved far is that we let those who are part of the problem uh, to be the fixers. And I can tell you for, for free, uh, those who are part of the problem are not part of the solution. And therefore, the civil society colleagues uh, need to line up themselves uh, to compete and challenge how some of these people are occupying positions of implementation when we know they are looking backward instead of looking forward. Okay. Uh, now, Husna, you... FAO presently chairs the donor group on, on land, and uh, the donors played a key role in, in triggering the reform process and supporting it materially. But we also noticed that they, they withdrew, they kind of went off, off the platform once the policies were adopted. Uh, what, 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 is, what are you guys doing now, and what would your thoughts be as, uh, you know, from your position on how we move to implementation? I know your program is about implementation. Yes. Okay, that's that's one actually. Is uh, we 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 are looking into actualization the how actually of uh, the implementing those uh, laws and policies into the country. But speaking in in uh, uh, not really on behalf, but speaking about the development partner partners, I think is uh, one of the things which we really need to 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 insist is the coordination angle uh, to the whole discussion of uh, land reforms and also looking at the priority areas again as the priorities area of, uh, of of focus within the development partners is very good and one of the most important aspect is the the networking aspects where you all move as a, as a as a group because one of the things we really want to to call forward to is uh, is not really institutional reforms per se but putting um, strategies which stabilizes the institutions in a way that they are coordinated they are networked and they integrate and complement each other and that this also includes the academias and also the the civil society organization so as we you don't look like we are all moving in different direction but more of complementing each others and that's that's one of the aspects we really need to to bring forward so as uh, as as a, as a, as a, as a, as, a, as stakeholders and with interest to the land reform 
to Kenya. And okay. it's very, it's very important, yes. Okay, that's the, the fact that we are implementing devolution, which is, uh, you know, a very major restructuring of governance. Does that, uh, you know, uh, bring into this discussion any challenges or opportunities? Uh, maybe start with Odenda on this. I think it is an opportunity uh, because we are basically de concentrating power from the center. We are basically uh, decentralizing management of, of, of land process. Uh, but I think the danger we seem to face and which we need to stand up against is uh, uh, devolving corruption, abuse of power that seems to be starting to be the, the face of devolution. I think that we need to uh, really uh, stop it. Uh, and, and I think we must be very alive that uh, uh, to also, just like we are saying, we cannot afford to, to let other people implement reforms on our behalf. I think we have done that the detriment. The, the, some of the people that were part of the problem at the national level are now the people that are heading devolution. And I, I, I fear the danger is they have just uh, moved from one level to another level and all what we can see uh, is a major danger as we speak right now it is very interesting that uh, kenyans are now even wondering how we can manage our debt if uh, corruption at the developed level and national level is almost uh, eating up 60 percent of what we are borrowing uh, from, from from other uh, uh, people to grow our economy. And, and I think that is an acceptable thing. So in the same manner, we cannot expect much from devolution until we make sure that we are not developing uh, abuse of power and corruption uh, alongside uh, the whole process of a good system that uh, we, we thought that the concentrating power from the presidents as it used to be at the center is the way out. Okay, uh, Dr. Dote, if you just round that off, we have a number, we have got a number of questions that we need to respond to. So, can do you have any word on this, the opportunities or uh, uh, constraints arising from devolution? I think devolution provides several opportunities uh, because it devolves resources. We require resources for purposes of exploiting our land and natural resources. Because it devolves power, it ensures that uh, we have people at the local level who can solve, help solve the problems. The greatest challenge we have with devolution in addition to corruption, is that uh, our frameworks have not clarified the place of devolution in land governance. And I think that's where work is required because there's lack of clarity as to what the devolved units can do in terms of managing, in terms of administering, and in terms of solving land, except in limited instances like survey. And even in those, you don't see them doing as much as you'd have wanted. Okay, uh, let's, let's look at the questions that we have and see if we can react to them. The first question I have on the platform is from Florian, and uh, it's a land expert. this is a land expert both with the UN and private sector. And the question is, don't you think that enforcement goes with registration and basically land information system, a concrete translation of the policy? Uh, if we, Husna, do you, do you, and are you able to answer that question? Yes, actually, um... I will agree. Yes, and I think of some of the some of the system um, it could be. It's not actually a concrete translation of the policy, but basically it's part of the translation of the of the of the of the of the, of the policy. Because as we say, registration entails a whole process. Let's give an example of Community Land Act. What is calling for, especially in terms of uh, of registration. Before even the registration, it talks of uh, recognition, and then it talks of uh, protection, and then basically you go to 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 registration so for me is that you have to to f currently the way kenya is situated everything has to go uh, together you cannot wait for one to be finalized because of already we have existing information which needs to be to be you know uh, regulated to be coordinated but also the registration process has to go on putting a fact that you have to first 
recognize what it is and bring uh, along the aspects of protection and protection entails a lot entails the management of the of the resource land what is there be it forest be it waters be it you know all those all those aspects of it and how they should be managed and basically now getting into 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 the registration process that's what i can okay, say because Okay, thank you. Because we have so many questions and we are running out of time, we're just going to have each one person answer a question. So the next question I'll ask Rumba to answer, and the question is from John Oweno, and he says, if the politicians who are supposed to provide leadership towards the implementation of the land reforms, policies, and legislation are reluctant because they are the major culprit, especially as far as historical injustice are concerned, where will the leadership come from? And I would like to request that we, we answer as briefly as possible so that we cover as many questions as we can. But then, uh, where will the leadership come from? The, the leadership comes from society. And as a society of Kenya, we need uh, to produce a leadership. And uh, politics, whether good or bad, informs our economic development. And to that extent, our, it's our responsibility to ensure that whichever leaders we have we hold them to account and they do what we desire i think the idea that we get politicians and we leave we let them go uh it, it, it is very dangerous and that is what we have been having in kenya once elected we just watch as they mess up the country and we we must put a stop to this thank you uh Collins, uh, Adam Leach asks, uh, thinking about uh, coordination and uh, uh, implement with government, within government, between government and uh, donors, how what is the what is the function that long-term planning uh, can play in uh, aligning uh, donor funding and land reform objectives? Michael, in after the NAC government came in place in 2002, there was the Economic Recovery Strategy, ERS. And ERS was then followed up by the government justice law and order sector. Both those documents provided a long-term frame of where government wanted to go first in terms of economic development and then in terms of reforms in the government justice law and order sector. What those then did, it ensured that anybody who wanted to work with government knew what to expect and it ensured that support and work was coordinated. I think long-term planning helps to clarify the reform trajectory, helps to ensure that resource allocations are, are long-term and not short-term and ensures that we avoid whims of different government agencies. And I think that's what we need to go back to in terms of the long, long reform process. Okay, Hussein Wario asks and uh... We, we are coming to you, Husna. Alongside the development of legal and policy reforms around land, the country has undergone governance reform with the creation of the county governments and the evolution of various functions. I think that's a comment and it is already, I think we have already talked about the implications yes. of that. Yeah, so yes. the next question, you'll have to answer this question, Husna. This is from mm -hmm. Ruth Menzendik. Ruth asks, what is the security of tenure for women in community lands? There is often controversy about whether discriminatory practices mean that women need individual land rights or whether they can have secure tenure within communal lands. Where does this stand in Kenya? And she recognizes this might vary from one community to another. Actually, with the with the with the uh, the the legal or oh, let me call it the law in Kenya. Actually, this is one of the the areas uh, uh, which um, okay. Let me start from the constitution. The recognition actually in Kenya. Uh, I mean, the gender rule and the recognition of, of women participation is was quite, was really a, st a standout uh, well. The other aspect is the inclusion within the law itself, the Community Land Act and the various <coughs> other land uh, in terms of inclusion and uh, and participation of women within the within the communal lands is quite uh, key to that and actually it even dictates how many you know the the gender role within the constitution but within the act also within the even the the, the aspects of uh, the leadership uh, with i think the, the act talks of the community land management um, uh, committees, which actually even between seven and fifteen people, but also it breaks down who should be in those in those committees. But the fact remains that the recognition of adults within the community assembly is so clear. So meaning that it didn't say the adults men. Actually, it talks of uh, uh, the adults 
uh, which um, which means even if a husband and wife, it has to be recognized a man and a woman into that uh, community register. So that is one of uh, uh, the, the the main focus around uh, around women, and also within the the management of those of those uh, structures. And when you talk of an assembly during the decision making processes, of course the women are. But the fact remains the cultural aspects of all this, the recognition of it. The law states that, but the practice around our own culture might really be a little a little challenge a little challenge and uh Odote mentioned earlier on in terms of we really need to look into the to the awareness of uh, of this and the awareness will include actually the influencing of why women should be part of the processes within 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 the i mean the practical processes within land governance in this in this country so that is that is where it is now and uh, i used an example one of the communities actually when they were talked about women and uh, co-ownership women, women and registration of of their land brought a question like who told you that we want uh, to 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 have our names on the title deed or who who told you that i want to make a decision on land in my community those are some of the real real challenges uh, i might not call them uh, challenges but those are some of the real issues especially around uh, our rural uh, engagement which comes out strongly of course as a person i'll put my culture before before the law but the fact that brings you that you have to be ruled by the by the laws so if there will be a claim there will be a complaint those are some of the things need to be out but i still insist the one the awareness component has to really to really be uh, to be done by all uh, stakeholders within and then again we were, for those who are really calling for their right after i mean whoever has a right has a responsibility so there should be also another move of claiming your, your right especially after you, you really understand that you have an you have a niche and also you have a, a percentage of participation within the land governance in this country we have very little time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we need to really push fast. Lumumba, there's a specific question to you from Kevin Mwanza. He asks you to elaborate on the maximum and minimum size of land issue that you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, you mentioned uh, that we have not dealt with that. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I think it's because uh, there are people who own land in Kenya in bigger sizes uh, that Kenyans feel they are not utilizing all of them. And uh, it, it, at uh, one time, it had been pointed out that people own almost uh, a space equivalent to our regional uh, regional areas uh, in terms of land. So the ideal situation was basically to make uh, the minimum so that uh, we offload the excessive uh, land in the market so that uh, other people can be distributed the land. But the, the issue of the minimum was basically the fragmentation of land into sizes that are not economically viable was also not helping because we have places in Kenya which uh, uh, their carrying land carrying capacity is, is just uh, uh, beyond uh, the, uh, the, the, the acceptable levels and they keep on fragmenting land beyond any reasonable uh, usage. For example, we used to know that uh, at least a plot of 50 and 100 is, is what you required at least to put up a comfortable shelter. But we now have people even owning 20 by 30 or 20 by 20. And that's not just for the kiosk, it's what somebody uh, deems to be habitat. And you have nothing else to do. And if, even, even for just the, the farming or, or grazing, uh, those spaces were not uh, done. So the reason why we have not done this, there was supposed to be the commissioning of a scientific study to determine uh, this, this element of minimum and maximum because of the different ecological systems within our country that would require that that minimum and maximum might not be uniform, but will be varied to shoot the circumstances so that we make meaning out of it. But the essence, was to limit people holding land excessively and people fragmenting land beyond any economic viability. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Band Eversman, and he refers to the land governance assessment framework. We have an assessment report for Kenya since 2016, and he wonders whether this cannot be used to ensure participation of all. I mean, cannot be used to guide the process going forward, since it provides for participation of all stakeholders. And the uh, example is given of where Ethiopia, where this has worked. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I have Collins respond to this? Yes, I can respond to that because I was part of the LGAF assessment for Kenya and we actually had the conversation on presenting the findings to both the minister, Professor Kaimeni, and the late PS El Maui at the University of Nairobi. The LGF assessment framework provides a very useful opportunity for reforms. Unfortunately, as soon as the reforms were presented, Kenya went into an electioneering mode. And that meant that the momentum for implementation was then lost. But I think as we start the process of reviewing our land policy, it provides very solid evidence and comparative information as to areas where we can improve so that we are able to address our land reform process. Thank you. Husna, uh, on community land, there's a message from Carol, a uh, uh, question from Carolyn Oko. She asks, what is the way forward for community land, especially where the extractives have been discovered? In some counties, they are convinced the community members to adjudicate the land, saying it is more secure and easier to sell. I think that's that's one of the of the challenges the the influence of uh, looking into adjudication and especially to private uh, and actually there is that rush currently even some of the group uh, group branches are really calling for their own private uh, I mean uh, uh, what do you call it? Subdivision of uh, of those lands to individual who can be able to, one can be able to 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 make. But it's so clear within within the law. And especially if also around uh, the benefit uh, benefit sharing, especially where uh, extractives are concerned, one also. But remember, within the within the constitution, uh, there's there's quite clear definition when it comes to to public land, community land, and 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 private land. But also there are other there are other policies which really entails in terms in terms of. Uh, at what at what level of the land, especially around the issues of surface rights and subsurface rights, how come in uh, how they I mean they they come in, and uh, the constitution also refers to the pro, uh, what you call it prompt, fair and just compensations, and uh, these are some of the things you look you have to look at them uh, deeply. But most of the land, if you look at an example of Turkana, we we have the the oil. Let me let me let me use that, but. Um, and they, 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 uh, the land there is uh, is not is not registered. So that's some of the of the challenges. Who 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 does what? Who is supposed to make those decisions in terms of the surface uh, rights before the subsurface rights? Who will give access to those to those uh, to those uh, that discussion? And it's a whole conflict and confusion even around uh, how much percentage of uh, you know the benefit will will go back to the communities and go to to the government and such type of things. So I will. Okay. I must say there must be gray areas, so we might we really need to 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 look deep into how this could could also be done. Okay, but then the Rachel Knight, whom both of us know, has a, a questionnaire which goes back to the issues we are raising about implementation. Uh, uh, quoting the example of Mozambique uh, with their their, their land uh, act in so in 2000, she says maybe we should think about a massive campaign in which the people demand uh, for implementation of the policy. And she wonders whether there, there are any plans to have a massive public uh, campaign uh, for implementation that would involve radio, TV, billboards, T-shirts, et cetera, theater groups, everybody participating. Is Kele thinking about this? Uh, we are thinking of it, but it, it has a positive value which we need to raise resources that go to it. I can tell you that uh, if I had resources, I said the communities need to stand up and be counted. And that process of public education, uh, awareness raising, mobilizing and out, reaching out uh, for uh, action is the, the thing that Kele loves best. But Kele is limited to the extent of the resources or the wherewithal to do what we know best. If we are given, we don't lack uh, leadership to steer the campaign to uh, effective conclusion. 
Okay. There is a, 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 a question from Wana. I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but uh, Collins, she, she says she, Wana is from Development Bank of the Netherlands and would like the speaker's views on how on the nexus between community rights and indigenous people's rights to land. Friends, can you respond to that? The nexus between community land rights and indigenous people's rights to land. You know, in several countries, especially in Latin America, where you have indigenous communities, then there is a big distinction between community rights and indigenous people's rights. In the Kenyan context, our conversations about communities and indigenous peoples are almost intertwined. Because when we start talking about indigenous people, we look around, we start asking ourselves, are those the communities of the Maasai? Are those the... <laughs> Uh, those are those are friends in the river, or are they are the Ogieks. So to a limited extent, you'd be looking at those kind of people. But with the community land right, it is much more expensive. It focuses on the Ogieks and the Maasai. The same way it focuses on the Luos and uh, and the Luyas. So I think uh, the framework for community land rights recognizes the unique aspects of indigenous peoples, but also the rights of other all other communities in the country. Thank you. Uh, this is really interesting, but I think we've overshot our time already. We have to wrap up and uh, would like to let the, uh, the participants know that all the questions that have been uh, asked will be responded to by the panelists and then the, 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 they'll be responded to by the panelists and the organizers will uh, send back the answers to the participants. I think we have to stop at this point. Uh, I think we apologize that there were so many questions and there's so much to discuss and we didn't just have enough time to answer everybody. But this is an interesting conversation which I hope will continue both online but also within the country in Kenya. I thank the panelists and I thank the organizers and. Uh, Let's hope that we will see more come out of the land policy reform process. Thank you, Husna. Thank you, Collins, and thank you, Denda. Thank That's you. True. Bye. Bye. -bye.